was a patient with post-traumatic dystrophy and she jumped out of her wheelchair and up. And since then, she never had a problem. I think that's now about 17 years ago. Serious medical diseases, mostly chronic diseases, but also malignancies. In these cases, there were instantaneous healings. And also those people did not get back the symptoms in the years thereafter. All of them reported, this is God, also the unbelievers. Because a lot of people say, oh, this is a placebo, it is fake, it is maybe something psychiatric. Hello and welcome to Lighting TV for this episode. If you want to support our channel, please like, subscribe or share everywhere. My name is Patrick Steetman and today we have a special guest, that's Dr. Kruidhoff. He's a family physician in the Netherlands and recently received his PhD degree on the subject of Christian healing prayer. A group of patients with severe chronic diseases were healed after prayer. Sicknesses like Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, anorexia, colitis ulcerosa, leukemia, and many more. And a group, a team of medical specialists, researched their medical files and did interviews. And the results were marked as remarkable, some even medically remarkable, and unexpected. So let's hear all about this. Welcome, Dr. Kruidhoff. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to have this interview. Yes. Congratulations on this uh, very beautiful book. It's a thick book. Yeah. And it's a very unique and extensive research, which uh, worldwide, some people don't understand that, but worldwide, this has not been done in this way before about healing prayer. So, you have been a family physician uh, for quite some time. 40 years you're in the business? Yeah, nearly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any idea how many patient contacts you had in the last decades? Oh, uh, yeah, I tried to count it on my, <laughs> in my consultation room. <laughs> yeah, I, I made a count, uh, around 200,000. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah. And uh, there was one patient by the name of Janneke Vlot, and she was healed of a severe chronic disease. And that started your journey in researching healing prayer. Can you tell me something about what happened uh, with this case, what kind of disease he had, uh, how long, and, and what started your journey? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, maybe it's good to say that as a family physician, I used to be skeptical about healing after prayer. In Christian youth work, as a youth, I was involved in Christian youth work and I saw people going for prayer, for healing, and they were not healed of serious diseases. Also in my practice, I did not see it uh, until the moment of Janneke Vlot. She was a patient with post-traumatic dystrophy uh, in a very severe form. She had different episodes of it in the arm twice in the leg, eventually leading uh, to severe handicaps, whereby she was mostly bedridden and in a wheelchair. Uh, and then she, she went to a prayer healing uh, uh, event and she jumped out of her wheelchair and up. And since then, she never had a problem. I think that's now about, what is it, 17 years ago. In Jesus' name. Halleluja. En dat leven nu in het, deze voet komt in het been. Amen. Halleluja. Hé, hey, de pijn verlaat je lichaam. Jezus. De pijn verlaat je lichaam. Jezus. Kom aan. Sta op. En loop met mij in Jezus naam. Kom aan. Hé, hey, waar is de pijn? Since then, she has not had a problem. Uh, then she phoned me and she was very delighted, of course. She cheered through the phone that she was healed. And I visited her and there were two things which I found very remarkable. One thing is she had not properly used her legs 
and to a lesser extent her aunts for many, many years. Mm. And after the healing, she was immediately able to cycle, to walk. She cycled even long distances in the night after her healing to try out what had happened. Uh, so that, that surprised me because she normally she would have needed rehabilitation for a yeah, considerable... Training, uh, she was, had no condition, uh, physical. And the second thing is she was used high dosages of morphine for the pain. And she stopped, she stopped with it immediately Cold without, <laughs> without uh, symptoms of withdrawal. Mm. So, and then, then after that, she got into contact with media, she appeared on television, she appeared in newspapers. Yes. And there was a lot of contradiction. Some people said, hallelujah, this is a miracle. Others said, this is, this is between her ears positive and negative reactions. And then she asked me to, that if journalists would need medical data, they could contact me. She allowed me, she consented, she gave me a consent uh, to, to supply people with the medical data. So I, so then, because there was a lot of interest nationwide, then I said, well, what I will do is I will write down your medical history with the medical data that we have, and we present it to a quality journal. And that was uh, the journal Trau, one, one of the journals known to have high standards, and they were interested, and they published an article. Then, and they invited people to come with responses. Then there was a lot of response after that article. Positive responses, negative responses. Some people saying, well, wow, this is good that a doctor is investigating it. Uh, mm -hmm. And others were saying, well, I'm happy that this is not my doctor. <laughs> so there were very different uh, responses. And in the follow-up, I came into contact with a professor of Theology at VU University in Amsterdam. And he said, uh, I think it would be nice if you as a uh, doctor, as a family physician would research the subject. So that, that, that was challenging because I had my questions. I was used to be skeptical, but what I was also inquisitive to find out what, uh, what happened. Yes. So we, we started to work on a, we then first started to work on a methodology, trying to find a suitable method as to how to study this subject. Yeah. Because as you said already, the, the, you don't find a lot of scientific literature on it. No. People find it very difficult to study the subject. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what, what you uh, found out that you needed criteria. And I read about that you used very specific Lambertini criteria. There were some criteria you adapted for this research. That's that's right. Well, we were looked we looked we uh, with some people we at the university we looked how are we going to study this. Uh, then going into medical literature, we found out that there had been quite a number of randomized controlled trials in mostly in the U.S whereby people were praying for one group of patients, mm -hmm. for instance, patients at a cardiology intensive care or patients with rheumatoid arthritis or, or AIDS. They were praying for one group, not praying for the other group. And the people did not know what happened. So the people who were prayed for, they did not know. That's right. That that's that's right. the randomized part of that's the, this trial. That's right. That's good. You say that. And then when Piling up all those uh, studies, they, they found out that if in the end, there is no significant effect of prayer. They, they, they published an article uh, on this in a systematic review. There were several systematic reviews. So they collect but, all the research there is and then they say, okay, is there evidence is, or no evidence? That's right. But also okay. there was a lot of criticism on this kind of study because can you study prayer the same way as you do a surgical intervention or a drug? Can you? I mean, that's 
Well, we felt that this may not be very proper because okay. if the the group you don't pray for can be prayed for from the outside, from their relatives, from a pastor or from by anyone else. So there's influence. So it is, so it is extremely difficult to randomize this into two groups. Then secondly, there are uh, a lot of theological remarks saying that it is not a proper way to to uh, investigate prayer in this way because yeah. prayer is i mean if you examine a drug it is a uh, it is a set it is a set drug exact 500 milligrams i mean it is one thing that you investigate yeah. but prayer can be so different I mean, it can be a prayer healer, it can be a, another individual praying. I mean, it is so heterogenic yeah. that it is that it is very difficult to investigate it in, in this way. So then, then we said, well, this is not the method that we should use. And altogether, we took five years trying to find a suitable method. Then I went to Lourdes, Lourdes pilgrimage site in France. It's a where Catholic. Pilgrimage sites, people go when they are sick. That's right. And they receive yeah. 2 million visitors per year from it's all over time. the world. It is very famous. People go there and pray. And if they have a, uh, if they have a special healing experience of a disease, they can go to a medical desk. It is the only pilgrimage site with a medical desk. There is a medical officer there who will then record or write down the, 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 the healing and he will ask the people to come back every year to find out if they are still healed then if they still remain healed after seven or eight years they can it will be presented to a group of 20 doctors from different uh, specializations and they can eventually say this healing is unexplained now in 140 years they found 70 unexplained healings but the criteria are very tough and the criteria they use are indeed the Lambertini criteria so the, 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 there should be no other explanation possible for the healing it, it may not be brought about by medication the healing may not be spontaneous uh, the, the, their, there may be there may be no other explanations so it's uh, a serious may, disease that's right and also they go through medical literature yeah. they uh, should not find any similar uh, healings in medical literature that are brought about by other mechanisms so they are extremely critical and it, those those 70 are all people with malignant diseases, multiple sclerosis, whereby it is very uncommon for a person to be healed like that. So their criteria are very tough. Yeah. We, we took their criteria, we thought this is a very sensible way of studying the subject. So eventually we formed a group of five medical specialists at the VU yeah. University Medical Center in Amsterdam. And together with some other people participating in the research, we set up a team that would evaluate medical cases of healing after prayer. So that is the methodology that we used and uh, we got approval for the study in 2015. So then after that we started, then there was again some interviews in, uh, in newspapers, uh, also in other media uh, also uh, on television yeah you needed patients cases that we needed cases and then after that we got 83 cases now this is this was very nice because i mean because you you need quite some cases to set up a a good a good study yeah uh, so i started to follow up on those 83 cases i started building medical files. Yeah, you could you were able to receive all these medical files from their home doctors, the family physicians, from the 
neurologist, for example, from, from the hospital. The yeah. So I started, yeah. I started to phone hospitals and doctors and trying to build files. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it did not. We we excluded those people with a healing experience before 1990 because we will, would not be able to still to find files from people so old. Uh, yeah. In the Netherlands, a file should be preserved for 15 years. So after 15 yeah. years, after 15 years, they can discard them. So. Uh, so, so, so in quite a number of cases, we were not, for various reasons, we were not able to build up a good file. Uh, also, in some illnesses, it is difficult to build up a file. For instance, in low back pain. I mean, yeah. low back pain. Um, if you have five years low back pain, and then all of a sudden you are healed, that's very special. But it is difficult to find good radiology uh, uh, data or other data to substantiate uh, it and to present it to a group of specialists. So out of that group of 83, we found we had 27 proper files, full files from serious diseases, serious medical diseases, mostly chronic diseases, but also malignancies uh, and others. And that was the group we presented to the five medical specialists. Also very strict criteria, even um, very serious diseases. So unfortunately, 900 million people with headaches and chronic pain in the world, they are excluded. Uh, that's uh, the sad part for them, I think, but uh, still they are able to be healed, of course. Yeah. But it's difficult to see, so it's more a biomedical way of looking at these patients and um, you have to see it on MRI scans or in, in blood samples so that's the criteria you used so more from a biomedical perspective that's right that's how we started uh, yes. although we had noticed that quite a number of people reported very strong uh, emotional and physical manifestations during that healing. I mean, some were overwhelmed, some were feeling very warm, some reported a wind going through the room, others were talking about a vision. So we noticed that there were a lot of phenomena around these healings. Yeah, you don't see one on an MRI. <laughs> you don't see those on an MRI. So we said, apart from medical evaluation, we should also go into those experiential data. So a, a senior a senior researcher from the university went to do qualitative interviews or in-depth interviews with a number of those patients and to then, find out yeah. what, what, what was happening around it. And that's a validated way in science to explore other phenomena? Yeah, that's right. We used a method, well, in qualitative research, they call it thematic analysis. So that's the method we used. It is a proper scientific methodology. So in that group of 27, the doctors would look into the medical file. Uh, if they said, well, this could be remarkable or in, um, medically remarkable or in, unexplained, they could say, well, in those instances, we want to know more about these patients. We want to know about their background. We want to know also about the subjective experiences surrounding the healing. So then the in-depth interviewer would go to that person at their homes and interview them. 14 people were interviewed and a separate article was published on this. So, when, when, when working with this team, uh, maybe it's good to explain a bit more about the team, the yes. team of five specialists. Yeah, were they all believers, for example, or no, people they, say that? They wa we wanted to have a differentiated group. We had yeah. people, we had people who were active Christians, people who were Christian, but not so active and people who were called themselves agnostic. Uh, 
So we had different uh, uh, different religious backgrounds in this group, also different specialists. Uh, I mean, internal medicine, hematology, surgery, neurosurgery, and psychiatry. Those were the main disciplines. And those people, if I mean, if I would present a case, an eye case or a ear, nose, throat case, they would go to the ear, nose, throat specialist in the hospital and present the case and ask about their data. So we could also include other yeah. specialists. So when, when evaluating the 27 cases, eventually they, uh, they said 11 cases are, they found 11 cases to, to be medically remarkable, but none of them was depicted as unexplained. So you had criteria medically or remarkable, medically remarkable and medically unexplained. That's right. And even though there was a lot of change with these patients, and we'll go into that later, but uh, there was nobody of this team would say this is really remarkable, medically remarkable, unexplained. Yeah, so, med- so do you have an idea why that is? Medically explained, many uh, medically remarkable were eleven were found to be medically remarkable. None was uh, found found to be medically uh, unexplained. Uh, so I think I should first go into the the eleven ones. Uh, yes. I think that the large majority of them were serious chronic diseases, uh, like you already said, uh, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, anorexia, chronic bowel diseases too, uh, with uh, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, and chronic uh, eye infections, mostly were all chronic diseases. And in these cases, there were instantaneous healings. And also those people did not get back the symptoms in the years thereafter, excluded. There's one, uh, there's one, there's one exception. The one with Parkinson's disease got back symptoms after eight or nine years. And, uh, quick but all the others, the, all the others were, were healed yes. and they uh, remained healed in the years thereafter because, uh, because we, we would not evaluate people after six months. We want we want there to be a period of several years in between as they as a as they as yes. a follow up as they lo- do in Lourdes as well. Let's pause for a moment to explore the eleven medically remarkable cases of this scientific research. What kind of diseases was happened during and after prayer? Number one was Crohn's disease since thirteen years. This is an inflammation of the digestive tract. After two prayers, she felt a sense of being touched in the digestive system, crying, falling in the spirit, a sense of being lifted from the floor and the wind in the hall. It was instantaneous healing since 15 years. Number two was acute leukemia complicated by fungal infections, abdominal abscesses and bowel perforation. Doctors sent him home expecting death in a few days. During the anointing of the sick in a reformed church, where he sensed the feeling of support, he received instant healing. He lived miraculously for another year. <laughs> Number three was multimorbidity and polypharmacy, meaning many sicknesses and many pills. Asthma, chronic arthritis with multiple disabilities, impaired hearing and incontinence. She had a personal desperate prayer before she went to sleep and felt strong emotions followed by a sensation of calm and being wrapped in a blanket. There was improvement of all complaints in a few weeks and no pills were used anymore, now five years ago. Number four was advanced rapidly progressive Parkinson's disease with maximal dosage of medication and wheelchair bound. During a prayer at an evangelical Easter conference, she felt a warm cloud, thick air sensed by others nearby as well and a tight net removed from her brain. She was instantly healed with 90% recovery and after eight years still good functioning. (laughs) Number five was anorexia nervosa. She desperately cried out to God while non-religious. She felt a sense of self-acceptance and return of appetite, 
a bright light and wind in a closed room. There was instantaneous improvement and weight gain from 37 to 50 kilograms. She had no relapses since five years now. Number six was chronic one-sided herpes keratitis, low vision and a failed cornea transplantation. While a second transplantation was planned, all pain and symptoms stopped at the moment of an intercessory prayer where she saw a bright light and fell on the floor and there was immediate relief of pain and her eye vision doubled. <laughs> 10 years later, still the case. Number seven was type B aorta dissection with severe walking impairment. There were multiple prayers in a reformed church where he felt a warm hand on his back, gladness and an urge to walk. There was instantaneous healing, no impairments and no relapses of complaints since 18 years. Number eight was chronic progressive multiple sclerosis for seven years. She was disabled and partly wheelchair bound. There was prayer prior, but after an afternoon sleep, just before going to a healing service, she woke up and she was instantly healed of all disabilities with no relapse since 12 years. Number nine was ulcerative colitis, psoriasis with arthritis and asthma since 14 years. During a healing service with three people praying, she felt warmth and a sensation as if claws were removed from her back. Instant healing now seven years ago, regaining full capacities, no more heavy medication and restarting sports. Number 10 was ulcerative colitis with diarrhea 40 times daily, about to undergo colectomy. During a healing prayer service where she felt strong physical sensations, there was instantaneous healing. The operation was cancelled with no relapses in seven years. The last one, number 11, medication-induced hepatitis with vanishing bile duct syndrome, liver and kidney failure, where liver transplantation was nearby. During intense prayers by different prayer groups at the same time, he had a feeling of calmness and a positive power as if he was lifted from the hospital bed. The neighbor felt it too. Afterwards, full recovery lasting for six years now. Let's go back to the interview with Dr. Kruidhoff. So these people were in healed instantaneously. Most of them were, all of, actually all of them regained full functioning. So they could do everything, no more pain, no more uh, problems. But in a number of them, because, I mean, if, if somebody is healed, then, then you want to know how, what, what's, what happened to the bowels or what happened with the scans. Yeah. So you make an MRI scan. Or CT. Yeah, that's right. And like with the case of Parkinson and multiple sclerosis, the MRI scans were still as abnormal as before. That's remarkable. And that's, that's remarkable. And that surprised us. So, and there were also some cases of, there were, there were also some cases of severe chronic bowel disease who healed instantaneously, but in one of them, when doing a coloscopy, when looking into the, into the bowel, still some lesions were found, but no longer with symptoms. symptoms I mean, so people had full functioning. So, there was a, there was sort of a gap between the, the symptoms and the object, the subjective uh, symptoms and findings and the objective findings. And then that, that puzzled us uh, a bit. So when you look at uh, this research with, for example, the, the patients with inhaling impairment, there was change, but you could not see it on the hearing tests. So biomedically, you could not explain it. But when you looked at the questionnaires you used, uh, there was a change. Can you uh, tell me something about that? Yeah, so we, we took validated questionnaires. So that validated means that these questionnaires were tested in scientific uh, circumstances. So these, and the questionnaires we gave to the people for their situation before the healing 
I mean, they should answer the questions what their life was before the healing and after the healing. And then we saw a significant difference. Difference. So that that was the same as what the people told to us. And then on top of that, I also went to relatives and friends and they confirmed uh, the differences in hearing in the living room when hearing music uh, in, in different uh, situations. On one occasion, the woman who, after her healing, slept, she slept, she was at a camping site and in the night after her healing, she, she was in, in the tent and she heard all kinds of noises she had never heard in her life. So some, someone was uh, walking nearby the tent on flip-flops, flip-flops <laughs> through, the, through the, the stones, yes. uh, the pavement. And she said, well, what is that? I never heard that sound. So her, her, subjec her subjective hearing was obviously very much different. Yeah. But so the audiology tests were not. And maybe it is interesting to add another case that was a, a case of multiple sclerosis. Yeah, can you tell me what it is uh, for the people who don't know? Multiple sclerosis is a neurodegenerative disease, a disease involving involving the brain and the nerves, leading to serious handicaps. Now this, this woman had a serious form of uh, multiple sclerosis, cognitive, but also physically. She was able to walk a distance of 15 meters without help. So she was most, mostly in a wheelchair or in a, a scooter, uh, in a, uh, yeah. when going outside of the house. So she, she, uh, she was also, she was no longer also able to work because of that. But then she, she, she wanted to go to a prayer healing session and she had already started praying for her healing before that time. And then during an afternoon sleep, she, slept half an hour when she started to sleep there was still the multiple scler sclerosis and uh, after the sleep the multiple sclerosis was gone so she could walk she could do a lot of things she couldn't before that's right she could actually she could do everything multiple sclerosis was completely gone so she went outside she walked around she started uh, driving a bicycle and a motorcycle? Uh, not, like... not at that moment, but okay. uh, when her husband came home, he was extremely surprised. <laughs> the family was crying and cheering and very happy. Uh, and she, she was active, more active in praying, but she had not yet visited a prayer healing session. So then, then came the moment to go back to the neurologist and because she Normally she would go to the neurologist and her husband would push her in the wheelchair. But now she decided to go on her motorbike because before the uh, multiple sclerosis, she used to ride the motorbike. And uh, so she entered the uh, neurologist consultation room in her motorbike jacket with a helmet under her No wheelchair. Arm. <laughs> no wheelchair. And of course the neurologist was surprised. So. Then the woman asked the neurologist, can you do an MRI? Maybe all, everything is disappeared. The neurologist said, yes, that's what we're going to do because I'm, I also want to see the results of that. So then, then, but on the MRI, all the abnormalities, all the density spots were still there. It had not changed after her healing. So, the neurologist said, well, I can still see the, I can still see all the abnormalities on the MRI. So you still have the multiple sclerosis. And then she said, well, yes, but I don't feel uh, multiple sclerosis anymore because I don't have any problem <laughs> yes. anymore. So what, what should you say? Is he still having the MS or is he not having it? So. 
Now, and, and then after that, until now, she is still, she has fully regained functions and that's already, I think, it's already 11 years now that she is fully okay. So yeah. the multiple sclerosis never came back, but the lesions are still visible on the, on the MRI. So in all those cases, in the MS case, in the people with deafness, there is a difference between functioning, subject, subjective findings, and the objective findings. Yes. Now, if you only look at the objective findings, like the neurologist did, then, then you should say there is still multiple sclerosis. Yeah. But if you only look at the objective findings, you cannot understand those people because they function fully different now. Yeah. So there is a gap between the subjective and the objective data. Now, if you want to understand these people, you will have to take serious all data. And here comes a problem in our Western medicine, because in our Western medicine, we have a hierarchy whereby the objective data are on top of the hierarchy and the story of the people, the subjective findings are at a lower level. Now, we don't fully understand what happened here, but if you, at least you will have to uh, put the subjective data and the objective data at the same level. There should be no hierarchy because if there is a yeah. hierarchy, well, you will never understand these people. So you need a horizontal epistemology whereby the subjective and the objective are at the same level. And that may, that, that is true for these people. And that may be true for other, uh, to understand other, other other phenomena in medicine as well. Yeah. And if you look at these cases, there is a lot of change. And if you look at it, what, what do the people around them say? So it, it's an amazing change because a lot of people say, oh, this is a placebo. And that means that there is, you know, uh, it is fake. It is maybe something psychiatric. It's all in the brain and they, yeah, they thought they had MS or Parkinson's. Is there anything to say about that? Did, did the research look at these phenomena too? Uh, that's, that's right. Well, that was one of our questions as well. Hey? Is this placebo or is it not? Uh, we, I discussed the data with a professor who knows a lot about uh, placebo, uh, who, who is very specialized in placebo effects. And she said, and I, I presented the findings to her and I asked her, well, can you call this placebo? Uh, I think with some of the patients we examined, there had been placebo effects, but she said there are two differences with placebo effects. One is the, the instantaneity. Out of all 83 cases, 61 reported an instantaneous healing or improvement. So if in a placebo effect, you usually you expect a gradual improvement. I mean, if a, if, if I sit across a patient in the consultation room and the patient trusts me or trusts the drugs that I give, then there is a, then there will be a placebo effect. But I never see that happen instantaneously. They don't get cured instantaneously in my consultation room because they trust me. So that's a difference. This, yeah, placebo effects usually are more gradual. Uh, the second thing is that quite a lot of these cases that we examined had no expectancy. Uh, most of them, of the 27 that we examined with the medical, uh, with, the, um, with the group of medical specialists, only I think it was only five who had a high expectancy. Most of them did not expect anything of the prayer. They did not expect anything of the prayer of the prayer healer, but, or they did not expect anything of their own prayers or group prayers. So in, 
while in placebo effects, expectancy is, is an important factor. So that is the, the, the lack of expectancy and the instantaneity yeah. uh, are, are contradicting placebo effects. So the conclusion of the specialist in placebo said this is not a placebo. Well, she said that this is contradictory. Yes, so, yeah, so we it only, doesn't we fit. We always have yeah. to be careful. So yes, so also <laughs> it's not black and white, but, but it's, it's not black and white. But she said, an, she said this is contradicting yes. placebo effects. Yeah. And some others say it's, uh, it could be a psychiatric disease. There are, for example, diseases, functional diseases that people experience they have multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's disease and they don't have it because there's an illness in their psychiatric system or situation. And did also a psychiatrist look at these cases? Yeah, one, one, of, the, uh, one of the members of the group of specialists uh, was a psychiatrist, psychiatrist and one of the supervisors of the study was a psychiatrist so we we looked uh, into that uh, as well there are some well one of the remarkable findings and i um, we have we have not yet talked about that yet is that out of 83 cases that we we uh, the disease spectrum that we of the, of the reports that we received was very much similar to what I see in family practice. That means people with internal diseases, neurological diseases, malignant diseases, psychosomatic diseases, psychiatric diseases. Mm. And the disease spectrum is, there was no, we had expected that there may be uh, a relatively large group reporting psychosomatic diseases or psychiatric diseases. Yes. This was not the case. I mean, it was a full, uh, the full breadth, the full, uh, the full scope of medical disease spectrum was was present. Uh, mm. Out of the eighty-three cases, we had ten cases with psychiatric disease. So that is certainly not a a, a very large group. That is what we would see in family practice as well. So what you are telling me is also that the the sicknesses were. Uh, the whole scope, the uh, whole spectrum of what you see right. in your practice. So that's interesting. And also that uh, it's, it, they are severe chronic diseases. So they are very disabling diseases. Like the, the woman with MS, she didn't have it for a few weeks, I suppose. It's, it's a process no, 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 of that's years. Right, that's right. Yeah. Yes. And if you look at the types of prayers which is used because we we always think there is only one way and that is uh, you have a service a healing service and there is a, a healer and he stands on the podium and only when the people come in front they will get healed that's right is that the, that the prayer you see with all these cases that's right that's that's a very interesting uh, element as well because some some things have surprised us and this was one of what this surprised us as well. We had actually more or less expected that out of those 83 cases, we had expected that most of them should would have gone to a, would have visited a prayer healer uh, in a prayer healing service with a charismatic prayer healer and a, an atmosphere with beautiful music, you know, and then expectations would uh, would go up and then people get healed. That's that's how we often yeah, that's look the upon this. That's the stereotype. But there were, out of these 83 cases, uh, there were 90 uh, prayer settings reported. Some of them reported two prayer settings. Of the 90 prayer settings, 31 were prayer healing events. Uh, but the majority were not, two thirds were not. Uh, those others were personal prayers, prayers by someone else, prayers in a group, anointing of the sick, which is a, a type of prayer which is used in some in churches. Uh, yes, the James 5 way of uh, uh, yes. Also liturgical prayers like during a 
during the Lord's Supper uh, in a church or in a monastery. So there were there were very many different yeah. settings, and uh, we found that we found it very. I mean, what what the beautiful thing? So it is it is not only services with a hyped up atmosphere. It it happens it happens in many other situations as well. Yeah, almost in daily life, everywhere they they that's, are with several prayers, several kinds of prayers. That's right. And the, the the people who were healed were they were they all Christian? They were not. Uh, the, most of them were Christians. Uh, they had different backgrounds. Uh, mainline Protestant churches, evangelical churches. Most of them were mainline Protestant churches, and then there was a group of evangelical or Pentecostal churches, Roman Catholic, uh, and there was also a group of non non believers. Yeah, so it's a wide diversity of That's denominations and even unbelievers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and what also happened with these patients is they received a uh, medical change, disabilities changed, but there were more, more changes if you look at uh, the way you research, you look at the, the whole person. Can you tell me something about other things which happened in their life course religiously or did they have changes in, in, in other perspectives due to the healing? Yeah, well, there is a large, especially the group with strong experiences. Eh? The, out of those 83, 43 reported strong physical and emotional manifestations, especially in that group, but also the others, but especially in that group, the, uh, they reported transformative experiences. They said this is not a, only a healing of the body, but it is a healing of the body, uh, the soul and the mind or the spirit. So it is a it is a healing of the full personality. And that that was very surprising. Because that's what, what I don't see in medical practice as well. I don't see people, you know, j jumping up. I mean, if they if they come back after antibiotics for pneumonia, then we I, I can notice that the person is healed, but not that his life has completely changed. And this is this is what we noticed in quite a number uh, of instances. So that's quite remarkable uh, in this in these cases. Did you expect that? Maybe I expected it in some cases, but not in so many. Yeah. So apparently, this type this type of healing uh, is is different from from what we see in regular medicine. Yeah, so that makes it a quite unique phenomenon, if I can say it like that. Yeah, it is related to the phenomenon of religious experiences. And there has been have been studies on religious experiences, and these experiences can have a very strong effect of persons. And in 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 the case of our study, these religious experiences came together with healings of diseases. Yeah. And what also happened is, what I read in your articles, is that people started to serve more. They were more active in church, in the social environment. Is that also, in many cases, uh, yeah, if, a situation? If, if you look at those people, uh, actually all of, them, all of them said that this healing was a healing by God. I mean, you could more or less expect that because people were asked to report such healings, but all of them reported this, uh, this is God. Also the unbelievers, because they said, well, this, this experience, this healing experience was so overwhelming that I cannot find any other explanation as that it should be an external uh, power. And uh, this, this was so impressive that it transformed their life thereafter. So you you find that people start to talk about their experience, start to be more active in church, uh, start to start to get to get 
socially involved helping others in all kinds of That's interesting. Uh, when you look at the Bible and you see Peter's mother-in-law, she got healed by Jesus. She had a fever. Oh, yeah. She stood up and she started serving. That's right. So yeah. that was an interesting yeah. uh, story I remember, which is similar. Yeah, that's right. One of the things uh, you mentioned is that the people felt manifestations like warmth, tingling, light, some say wind, love, power. And uh, I was looking into, in the Bible and I was looking at Mark 5 and there was a woman with the issue of blood. And she also had a manifestation because it said that immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. And in Acts 3, the lame man at the gate, beautiful, Peter uh, yeah, healed him in Jesus' name. And it says immediately his feet and ankles were strengthened. So there was also a manifestation of strength. And of course, with the wind, I was immediate, immediately thinking of Acts 2, where of course uh, the, the Holy Spirit fell. And uh, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Because in one of the cases, this happened. There was a woman, maybe you know the story, but she felt wind but not only she felt wind but also the people around her can you tell me something about that case that's that's right uh, that was a case with Crohn's disease uh, of a woman who was in a healing session and she experienced a sudden healing and she felt a wind in the room in and the room, while the room was closed And we heard that from another person as well, who was, she was on her own and she felt a wind as well. Then the woman with Parkinson was in a, in a, that was not a healing event, but that was a conference. And during the conference, she was prayed for and she had very strong experiences. She had the experience of a net, tight net being taken from her head. And she uh, jumped up from her wheelchair as well. And then the other, it was reported that the other, the other uh, people were very much sensing, uh, sensing phenomena as well. And they call it a warm, thick air, she called it. Yes. Yeah. So, so all the people are surrounding her. That's right. Experience something. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And then this woman with uh, Parkinson's disease, some people are skeptical. And I talked to a neurologist, a professor who is specialized in Parkinson's disease. And you wrote an article, very scientific. Well, you can see that there was a lot of change with a severe chronic uh, Parkinson's disease. And she got healed. And when I uh, showed this article and, and told His professor, he said, this is impossible. This is not possible. <laughs> and what can you say what happened to her? And what could you say to this uh, professor? Well, I very much understand his reaction because it had been my reaction uh, as, as well. With, with these medical evaluations, it is important that we go very much into detail that So the, the group of five specialists consulted a specialist neurologist in Parkinson's disease and a specialist psychiatrist disease uh, in Parkinson's disease to find out if there could be uh, other explanations. And we, we could not. We walked through placebo mechanisms, conversion mechanisms, and we could not. And uh, because of that, we, we said we found this medically remarkable. We did not say that we found this case medically unexplained, because also in her case, there were, abnorm the, there were still abnormalities on the, on the scan. If you look at the patients who experience this, the, they don't care, I think, about uh, if it's there or not on the scan. I am healed, I can do everything I could not do. That's right. So that's yeah. the subjective part again. Yeah, that's right. And, and that's so important, I hear in, in this conversation, to take that into account. That's right. 
Well, and it's interesting that, you know, there have been other studies, some other studies on manifestations surrounding these healings, qualitative research. There is a study by Norwegian uh, authors studying 25 such healing experiences. They find the same uh, phenomena. There is a study by uh, an American author uh, of 21 of these experiences and she said in 16 out of 20 there were very strong experiences, life-changing. Then there is a, uh, a, a French scientists who researched more than 400 healings in Lourdes and uh, he said in two-thirds of them there are very strong manifestations, a, a wind, a f an experience of warmth, all kinds of experiences. So, so what we found is also found in other studies. So the, the recurrence of that phenomenon I find very remarkable. And when you look at um, healing or recovery of patients like MS or Parkinson's disease, is it known that there are other cases in literature also that they are, they are gradually improving? Because this is all instant. That's something which is a red line. Instant, remarkable and unexpected. But if you look at literature, are there also cases where people recover? No, we, we, uh, we, we, we looked into that and we, in medical literature, you won't find many, rarely, then if you look in popular literature, you can find some stories. In the case of Parkinson's disease, there is the only thing I found was that there was a healing of a nun in France from Parkinson's disease. And that, that, that was very well documented by Rome, because in Rome they have similar procedures as in Lourdes. And uh, that, that healing was found to be unexplained. But that nun healed from serious Parkinson's disease, but she was fully healed after that. Right. It's also on the scans also. Uh, that's right. Yeah. And but that's uh, not a lot. So it's very that's rare. Not, that's right. Yeah. You see, so, so it is, again, a very unique phenomenon that people who experience a healing after prayer that it's instantly and it's remarkable and unexplained. That's right. So there seems to be a sort of pattern of instantaneous healings, especially functional healings with surrounding manifestations and transformation of the, yes. per, uh, the person. Mm. That seems to be a pattern. And I think that would need, we should further go into that. It would need further investigation because yeah. I, that would be very interesting. Now, um, during your defense of your thesis, there were opponents and uh, one of them had an interesting question. Uh, it's Dr. Thijs, he's an internist and he says, he indicates that prayer can actually be part of daily practice, praying with a possible cure as an outcome because of these changes. And he said, worth a shot, right, he said. It's worth a shot, maybe. And uh, can you respond to his question? Well, that's, I mean, that's the, the, the general effect of prayer. I mean, prayer, prayer and spirituality can be very, uh, I think spirituality can be very helpful. I think, I think a broader, a broader circle in medicine says that, well, spirituality can be very helpful. And this is well, documented that are Amer that are scientists. Koenig in the US is one of them who has very well documented the positive effects of spirituality and we should very well realize it and we, we can also we can also use that in medicine. Yeah. And I think we are a bit too hesitant there. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned earlier that also the university was very hesitant because they said, well, will we have uh, negative publications or negative responses? That's not good for the university, maybe, and that's not good for the subject. But they did a research on the research you did through the Netherlands, and they found something interesting. 
Yeah, they they found that part of the people responding on social media and part of the articles in magazines, some of them some of them were positive, others were negative. I think you would expect both. Of course, sixty percent of the responses were neutral. Uh, that that was that was interesting uh, because apparently there is a a lot of people uh, are interested in the subject and therefore i think it needs more it needs more investigations yeah it also needs more investigations because of what churches are doing i mean there are also and now i become uh, a bit critical there are in prayer meeting there are people saying that you can if you pray you will be healed and if you are not healed, you should pray more or you should go more into Bible study. Now, what is interesting is that part of the people, uh, uh, quite a number of the, the people that we examined did not expect anything. So their faith was very small or there was no faith at all. And still they had a, a healing experience. So it is I think it is not very, I think it is not, it is not a good practice to doubt the faith of a person yes. if the person is not healed. That's not good. It can yeah. also harm it a person. Harm people. Yeah. And uh, that, that's why this type of investigation, and I hope that, I, I hope it can also help and teach prayer healers that, that this is what, what is actually happening. Yeah, so let's say we call it in uh, Christianity a sacred cow or a certain belief that if people have unbelief, that's the reason why they don't get healed. And in your research, it's very obvious that this is the other way around. So that's, that's, that's right. But it also creates, there are also uh, in the Netherlands quite a number of theologians who said that healings were only for the times of Jesus. Yes. Not not nowadays. Yes. But uh, this study is contradicted, contradicting yeah. that view. It is not so that that it has. It is not so that nothing happens now. No. We have documented. Uh, yes. Uh, so that's we have also. Documented, yeah. <laughs> we have documented healings. That's also a sacred cow. People believe. That's right. Uh, yes. That's right. And we we have to find out about the facts. We have to find out about yes. what happens. And um, so I think we mentioned a lot of uh, things. If you look at the people um, who are skeptic, some say, well, if you look at Lourdes, that's only 1% of all the millions of people who received this healing. And it was a very specific uh, exclusive group uh, with severe diseases. But is it harmful if you pray for people and they don't get healed? You, yeah, you give them something, they get disappointed, maybe more mentally disabled, you give them false hope. That's what some people say. What, what is the experience with the people who are not healed in Lourdes, for example? That's right. Well, the interesting thing with Lourdes is that, uh, I mean, uh, people are not giving, given false hope. I mean, they come there for, they come there to pray, to pray for their life, also to pray for healing. But uh, what, what I saw when I was there, uh, when people were not healed, they were still in, encouraged by the prayer and by what they have heard. I mean, and, and this is also what I see in medical practice. I mean, I've seen a lot of people praying, praying for their disease. And I saw many people who were encouraged despite the fact that they were not healed. So there's more, even here, uh, there's more effect than only the healing. We, we've seen many cases getting healed, but if you're not getting healed, you still see the other experiences of people That's in a right. positive sense. That's right. And it can give encouragement and it can give support. But it does not give support or encouragement if you say you are not healed, so you have to pray more for healing. Exactly. Because then, then it can become harmful yeah so that's an interesting way of looking at it 
it's, it's, it's maybe interesting to add on that because those yeah. people, we have followed up on those 83 people. And after four years, we managed to reach 59 of them. Yes, that's and quite a lot. Out of 59, 50 were still healed. Seven, two had regained the disease and seven had regained some symptoms of the disease. So most of them were, were still healed. Yes. But what is what is what is uh, remarkable as well is that i mean if people after people were healed from a disease after people had a healing experience after prayer life continued so some of them had contracted other diseases some of them had contracted a malignant disease and they had passed they had passed away yes so life goes on i mean if for instance the woman with Parkinson's disease is a very good example. She, she was, had a healing experience from Parkinson, which we found medically remarkable, but she had breast cancer three times, once in one breast. Then she had a relapse in that, on that side. And then uh, after that, in another breast, she had a myocardial infarction. Uh, she had a severe pancreatitis, and those were all treated and healed by doctors and in the hospital. Yes. So, but it also indicates, and then maybe I get yes. to this picture because you may wonder how how can you position this? Now, life goes on, and in even the people who are healed in them life still goes on with its good sides and its bad sides so how how should you now look upon these healings well i look upon them as this is a picture here from from uh, the area behind i look them that th there are these these healings there are these healings for which we don't have words and i uh, I call, you can call them sun rays or a light or a beam uh, of, of, of the sun, but it shines through, it shines through the rest of life. So it doesn't take away, you can see that the light is shining through the branches of a tree and you can see that there is a mist, a fog. Uh, there is a fog, so the light shines through the the branches of the life and through the fog of the life. So the, the sun is there and special, uh, the, the, the rays of the sun are there, but it doesn't take away the branches or the fog. And this, this, is, this is actually how I look upon it if I look at all those cases. Yes, so the, that, and that's the truth of life, of course, because in the end, it's beautiful that we are getting healed of diseases, that's beautiful. But in the end, we all gonna leave our body. And um, so it, it, it is something which is for this period of time on earth, it is a very uh, significant and valuable way of seeing uh, changes and live as long as we can, you know, to see what we can do on this earth. But in the end, yeah, you're right, these are uh, this is not a perfect world yet, but it is still shining. And, and that's a beautiful picture of, of life itself. That's right. Yes. And, and as a doctor, I just continue to practice in the same way as I always do. I mean, when people come to me, I give them, I treat them, I examine them. I do x-rays or laboratory. I give them antibiotics. And I mean, that, that doesn't change that medicine doesn't change that goes on the same way yes. but then still these these the sun rays occasionally happen yes so uh, to conclude um, I have two last questions and that is uh, you indicated that this thesis would have to be worked out practically and uh, you did, didn't get to do that and what would this look like to make what you research practical that's right. Well, I think the, 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 the first thing is it, it should be, it could be interesting for anyone who is inquisitive in this area. 
then uh, it, it, it could have practical implications for theology. The, the, the professor in theology who, who was a supervisor in the study said there is a relationship between theology and reality. I mean, we can learn from the Bible, but when we can also learn from seeing what happens in reality. I mean, when we see that uh, healing experiences after prayer happen occasionally, but in many instances they do not, then we should learn from that and we should learn. We should learn, we should specifically learn from those people having such healing experiences because those people often get a lot of negative reactions, even, even from their churches. I mean, the people who participated in our study often had negative responses in the church, also from their, from, from the reverends uh, or from other church members, reactions of jealousy. So, they found it often very difficult to tell about their story. It's, it's of course, it's difficult. I mean, if you get healed from a bowel disease and somebody else dies from a bowel disease, it is difficult to tell your story. But still, we should, we should learn from those people. And learning from them can be important for theology. So there it has practical consequences. It has practical consequences in medicine as well. There was, there was a, somebody writing a very interesting column in Trau. Uh, she said, in medicine, we, we use, we find that medicine should be predictable and re phenomena should be predictable and repeatable. So if I treat a, a pneumonia in my practice, then when I listen to the chest and I hear abnormalities, I know that the chance of that person having a pneumonia may be uh, 80 or 90 percent. Now, if I give antibiotics, I know that 80 percent of them are better when they come back after one week. So this is, this is predictability and repeatability, which we use in medicine yes. all the time. Now, sometimes during your consultations, you will find people who tell something different. They come, don't come with pneumonia or another disease, but they tell you a story which you don't understand. For instance, they tell you that I'm healed after prayer. Now, you can just say, well, I can't do anything with that. I don't know what to do with it. But if you take those, those stories serious, those stories which are not predictable, not repeatable, then you can still learn a lot from them. I mean, you can't say that if somebody goes to a, for prayer, you can't say there is a predictability of 80% that he will be healed. And you can't say that the same phenomenon will be repeated in 80% of the cases when it is repeated in another person. So that makes us very uncomfortable with this type of healing, but still, still the events happen. Still, sometimes it happens that sometimes comes to you, like uh, in my case with Janneke Vlot, you know, something special has happened to me. And after Janneke Vlot, I had it another two or three times that somebody came and said, I was healed after a prayer uh, in a very special way. So. In my consultation room, I have seen 200,000 patients and three or four times during all those years, I have witnessed a special healing. Should I then discard of them, say, well, this is all between the years or this is placebo or should I be interested and research it, be inquisitive? And I think the scientific approach should be to, to also to be inquisitive in those rare instances. So I think that is the relevance, the practical relevance for medicine. Yes. So what we actually could conclude, we need more expectancy of the unexpected. <laughs> that's right. So that's right. Yes. Well, thank you very much. And um, 
we we'll hope to uh, see more research in this area, maybe with you, but maybe around the world. And I think that's also something which is happening with for amongst and um, Dr. Candy Gunter Brown and, and her husband, they are also in the US doing a lot of research and um, we're looking forward to hearing from this area in a broader way than only the biomedical framework, but a more wider framework. That's right. And thank you very much for your questions and your interest. You're welcome.